skipping classes today to take you all yeah. uh, oh. I'm actually supposed to be in my paleobiology class right now. So. <laughs> but I think I learned more out here anyway. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you guys, has anyone been before? You Just you? Oh, okay. That's great. It's amazing how many geologists from Calgary have never been, you know. It's on the bucket list. Yeah, yeah. Um, an avalanche came through here in 1971, and it took out what was the, uh, I think it was called the Kicking Horse Lodge, which was a, a CP Rail Hotel at the bottom of the hill here. So, field like a lot of the, uh, a lot of BC has a history that's like closely tied with railway development. Said, oh, hey, you should come check out the trilobite beds. And so, Walcott at the time was a, the head of the Smithsonian Institute. He had also been the head of the USGS and the, actually one of the founders of NASA as well. So kind of Really? Random fella. And, yeah, and sent them so sent them down the hill in slabs. His wife broke them all up at the kit base camp. They sent them down on horseback and then on the train back to Washington D.C. And so Walcott's specimens are still sitting in drawers in in Washington D.C. in the Smithsonian. And they've been worked over a little bit. Yeah, is um one thing I'll meant to point out later on. But you can notice cathedral is uh the bedding on cathedral is actually dipping slightly from the east here. And uh, hopefully when we get back to town, it'll be clear enough to see the mountains there. It overlies the Stephen Shale. So we have Cathedral, Stephen. Uh, just as a general, I'll talk a little bit about some of the history and the science behind the, the Burgess Shale. I do know more than what I say, so if you guys are curious about, like typically we talk a bit about mountain building and climate change and how glaciers carve the Rockies, but I'm sure you guys know a lot of that stuff, so I'll kind of skip over stuff with you. But if you are interested, feel free to pick my brain as we walk. I'm happy to talk about a lot of this stuff. And so one thing I just like to do is give you guys a pitch of the Cambrian world, and for, even for those geologists here, I think some of you might have forgotten what the world was like then. So. There's a couple switchbacks, then we have lunch, and uh, we continue on for about half an hour, and we get to underneath the where the birch shale is, and after that, there's a series of steepish switchbacks to get to the quarry itself. So the restricted area is actually just above the trail itself on the ridge, and uh, you just get some fossils that slide down to the what we call the discovery site there. So we'll stop there when we. I'll show you it when we get there. This is Mount uh, Carnarvon peeking out of the clouds here. And uh, Michael Massif is a big one up here with the uh, peak on the right. And you can see Emerald Glacier up ahead here. And uh, if you look, um, it's actually called Noceum Falls because you can't see it from So that's that's where the extent of the Emerald Glacier was during what people call the Little Ice Age. So I guess that maxed out around 1830 in this area. Yeah. Well, it went from 1200 to late 1800s but the maximum extent here was somewhere between 1820 and 1850 in this two types of rocks against each other they kind of gradually change into each other but one thing that's really special about this site is it's a very direct contact so much so that they thought it was faulted in for a really long time but there's no evidence of that and it's also very laterally continuous so much so it's called the kicking horse ramp so it's an area of this drastic change phases change essentially between the limestone and the shale 
and uh, and it's thought that it was kind of an undersea cliff, so it was called the Hippie Ghost Garden. Animals actually lived on the shelf, but they were carried by mud flows, and so they were kind of carried by what we call turbidity. So big, like muds, essentially underwater mudslides that would. Discovery site where Walcott found his first fossil 101 years ago. Um, as a, the legend goes, that he was a was a cold in the late August, and riding his horse, and there was a large slab of a shale on the ground in front of his wife's horse, so he, he hopped off to, to move the rock out of her way and clear the path for her, and he spotted a fossil. And supposedly, in this hail, it was a so I like to say that uh, it speaks for. Uh, Walcott's eyesight is nothing else, because the Morella, which is the critter that's on my badge here, is about the size of a fingerprint. So, this is kind of about, yeah, as I said, there's 150,000 samples of the Royal Ontario Museum, and they represent about 250 species, so John Menecker is still uh, publishing a lot of these species. He, he just uh, put out a, papers, a couple of papers this year on the sea cucumber thing, and... Uh, Nectocaris, which is a, which is a classified as a mollusk. Um, so we have some sample specimens here. So we have a few examples of specimens that have been found in the quarry itself. So I always think the thrill of the hunt is part of the fun. So I, and then uh, if you have questions about any of the other ones, you can always ask. So I like to start with Morella. Morella was a, the first one found, and it's still the most abundant fossil that's ever come out of here. It's pretty neat. Um, the area there was named after uh, Walcott's son, Sidney. For a long time, he was considered to be the biggest uh, virgin shale specimen. They had three lobes, so if you look at the fossil, it's like, I just remember, like, a dry and little light. And I also think he kind of looks like little, uh, little ice cream cones. There's two, there's one there, one there. And never really well understood. They thought he kind of walked on these strange spine things, and then he had these tentacles that came out and kind of passed food to, to his mouth. And that was another part of the mystery, and it wasn't until the 90s that they found, this is a cast of the fossil they found, but they found this guy. And the teeth are the hard parts, and the bodies are quite soft and squishy, so you don't tend to find, like, full bodies of them very often. And uh, it's one thing that's kind of neat, you know, where it took a hundred years between the first publication of it. And chordata is a phylum that we all belong to, so anything with a backbone and vertebrate belongs to chordata. And uh, Empakaya was one of the first ones found that, that uh, had a chordate. So it's pretty exciting to find something that, you know, was the big, like, you know, ancestors are all vertebrates. Right? In the Cambrian, there's a lot more diversity now than there was years, like hundreds of millions of years ago. Whereas uh, Stephen Jay Gould is one big proponent for saying, you know, no, 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 the greatest diversity. talk about assemblages, how can you work on things like that? Like, are there, are there places in the out? Charles working for his PhD thesis, he did a lot of statistical analysis of all of them. And uh, there's actually only about, I think, about 10% of the beds, and it would be really rich in fossils. And then the kind of like, the gradual pelagic sediment would not have much fossils, and there wouldn't be much fossils in those. And that's why even like when you look at some of the rocks, like some of them have a lot of different fossils in one rock, whereas a lot of the rest of them.